Welcome to our webinar today. It is the top of the hour, so let's go ahead and get started. To all of you, our many guests across a number of time zones, both nationally and internationally, good afternoon, or perhaps it's good morning. My name is Emily Eberly, and I will be your moderator today. I want to let everyone know that by attending this webinar or by watching the View on Demand recording, you can earn credit contact hours for the CRCE and or the CNE. At the end of this webinar, you can obtain those continuing education credits by logging on to www.saxtesting.com forward slash INIT. You'll need to complete the post-test and evaluation form. Upon successful submission, you will be able to print your certificate of completion. We would like to disclose that this educational module was made possible through an unrestricted educational grant provided by Covidian. And unless cited, the contents and conclusions of this course are solely those of the course provider. Also, we'd like to disclose the following information for you, that Dr. Restrepo, who is our planner and speaker, is a speaker and is on the Medical Advisory Board for Teleflex Medical. He is an investigator and speaker for Covidian. He's on the Advisory Board for Salter Labs. He's an investigator for Fisher and Paykel, and he is an investigator for Hillrom. Furthermore, there will be no off-label use of product discussed during this webinar. Our speaker today is Professor and Director of Bachelor's Degree Completion Program, Dr. Ruben Restrepo. He is at the Department of Respiratory Care at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, Texas. He is trained in medicine at Medellin, Colombia. And Dr. Restrepo has achieved academic positions at Georgia State University and then also at the University of Texas. He has published widely in the field of respiratory care, including book chapters and articles, and has given many presentations. He is a reviewer for several major journals in respiratory and pulmonary medicine and is the recipient of many honors and awards for his teaching, publications, and volunteer work. Dr. Restrepo, are you ready to get started? Yes, I am. Thank you, Emily, very much. And good morning and afternoon, everyone. Thank you for participating today. Uh, today's topic is one that is of high interest to all of us who have had and still have a chance to routinely monitor patients in the post-op period. Uh, but even more important to those who often see patients experiencing uh, post-op respiratory complications. So what I have selected today as learning objectives will be, of course, to describe some of the indications for respiratory monitoring, explain the difference as far as I can between the uh, difference on, between oxygen and ventilation, compare and contrast some of the available monitoring techniques, and finally, hopefully to provide uh, some of the evidence-based recommendations on the use of respiratory monitoring and how much of the impact that this can be making in the prevent, prevention of uh, post-op respiratory compromise. So what I have uh, selected as my outlines as follows. I will first uh, discuss a little bit of the background information in terms of the incidence of respiratory compromise. I will then discuss the specific monitoring techniques and how they impact the post-op respiratory compromise. And finally, I will try to describe what probably defines the ideal uh, monitoring device. So let me go ahead and get started with, again, respiratory compromise, because I think I believe that in order to provide relevance to any topic or any condition, it will be useful to know some epidemiologic information, such as the incidence and the impact. Uh, the reason why we we are talking about this uh, this uh, particular talk, topic is because uh, post-op respiratory complication, respiratory depression, respiratory compromise, it's just simply because more and more we find patients undergoing uh, procedures outside the operating room that are not overseen directly by anesthesiologists. Why? Because the interventions are much safer than they were before. Uh, procedural sedation has allowed many of these procedures to be performed in a patient setting, and clinicians have become more familiar with the use of sedatives and analgesics. Uh, we have apparently, uh, we'll discuss why apparently later, improved monitoring so mortality rates are lower in the overall perioperative uh, period. 
Uh, nevertheless, patients continue experiencing uh, frequent episodes of hypoxemia, and unfortunately, we heavily rely on visual inspection and pulse oximetry to detect alveolar hypoventilation, which is the landmark of respiratory uh, depression. So what about, uh, again, respiratory depression? Uh, Respiratory depression is also called alveolar hypoventilation, and we know that is the most significant complication of sedation and general anesthesia. Uh, procedural sedation, however, by definition, may cause a degree of respiratory depression, but typically uh, no one that should require any, uh, any special ventilatory assistance to resolve. So that means that we assume as clinicians that every patient undergoing these procedures is not going to have any serious complications that will make an indication for assistant, uh, assistance of mechanical ventilation or even non-invasive ventilation. However, if patients go undergo this procedure and they have a BMI greater than 30, 40, uh, even conscious sedation may be associated with moderate to severe respiratory depression. Respiratory depression refers to a reduced activity of the respiratory center in the uh, steel leading ventilation. So in general, it is, it is always a side effect of all CNS, uh, central nervous system depressions that include sedatives, opioids, and general anesthetics. However, each uh, medication or each drug has a predilection for depressing either hypercapnic or hypoxemic drives, as you can see on the table. Opioids, for example, depress primarily the central chemoreceptors that control the hypercapnic drive, while uh, inhalation anesthetic and benzodiazepines exert greater influence on the peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid and aortic bodies that control the hypoxemic drive. Uh, but we know that, again, these are dose-dependent um, uh, side effects, so at higher doses, all these agents can really depress both uh, mechanisms. When we have the presence of general anesthesia and, and the patient undergoes uh, this type of procedures uh, with uh, deep sedation, uh, there is a decrease in the cortical response that causes loss of muscle tone and therefore airway patency. Uh, so the additional expression of this neural and muscular response reduces the overall response to asphyxia that sometimes we may be able to observe in these patients. But I think it will be useful again to look at how often these uh, events actually happen. Uh, when looking at the incidence of post-op pulmonary complications and respiratory depression, the range can fluctuate between 2 and 40 percent. So sometimes uh, it is hard to determine exactly what the real story behind this. But if we figure that almost one out of eight patients undergoing a surgical procedure is expected to have a post-op pulmonary complication, and this may mean atelectasis, pneumonia, and hypoxemia, this may be a very, ser very serious percentage. A small percentage, uh, at least a smaller percentage than, the, than this, between 1.5 and 7 percent, will actually develop respiratory depression. So let me clarify the concepts that I explained on, the, on a previous webinar that uh, complications such as leptosis, pneumonia, and hypoxemia do not have to end up in respiratory depression or respiratory compromise. It is only, again, a smaller percentage of those patients are going to develop insufficiency or even arrest. Uh, despite the fact that overall monitoring has improved compared to a few decades ago, it is expected that more cases of respiratory depression will occur unless we change the way monitor, we monitor post-op patients. So an estimated increase of almost 32% was calculated by Agarwal by the year of 2019 in a very recent report. What is the uh, clinical impact of uh, PPCs and respiratory depression? I think when we look at the clinical impact, it has become clear that the presence of post-op pulmonary complications increases the risk of mortality and, of course, the number of readmissions, which is something that is extremely concerning to hospital administration. In this uh, in study by Curry, they found that compared to patients without post-op complications, the 30-day, as you see, one-year and five-year mortality was significantly higher. The number of readmissions was twice the rate of those without complications, and a dramatic 87% reduction in survival was observed in these patients. So when we consider beyond the simple post-op pulmonary complications, say, terms uh, that may appear would be respiratory depression, failure, respiratory compromise, and even arrest may be part of the vocabulary we, we can hear uh, when we refer to this type of patients. So I think it is useful to, to see what is the... Uh, the typical definition of uh, respiratory depression uh, that includes a respiratory rate less than 10 breaths per minute, very shallow breathing, and again, that, as you can imagine, relies heavily on clinical observation unless 
type of volume or minute ventilation are measured. Compromised level of consciousness, for example, the score greater than minus 3 on the Richmond agitation settings scale, and pulse altimetry that typically is lower than 90%, unless, of course, the patient's baseline is lower for at least uh, 30 seconds. So one, one question that I, that I have for you, and I wish we, we had this a little bit more interactive, but I think um, that's why you see something to kind of fill in the blank. So in order to evaluate our ability to really detect these episodes, it would be useful to determine how often we monitor patients. And this uh, very nice study by Williams and colleagues from uh, Villanova University in, in Penn, um, Penn University, evaluated how often 90 institutions in the U.S. use pulse oximetry and cognography during intravenous uh, patient control analgesia and epidural analgesia. As you can see, pulse oximetry, and I'm going to start just uh, again working through the transitions, was used more intermittently in these two particular settings. Again, 58%. Continuous actually drops by, again, less than half. And during epidural analgesia, it would be, again, 58%, and a little bit better in terms of continuous. But I think something that you probably cannot imagine unless you have a set of slides in front of you would be the small percentage of uh, patients that are being overseen or just monitored with capnography in these uh, particular settings. So when do we decide uh, to use continuous monitoring uh, of the respiratory status. So in order to understand that, I think it would be useful to find out exactly some of those uh, particular indications. You can see here that uh, moderate sedation, which is like the one that is uh, commonly seen in conscious sedation, severe sedation, analgesia, general anesthesia, are going to be very common indicators of in, uh, monitoring, and the reason is quite simple, because under those circumstances, we can have compromise of the respiratory function. But a very important question is what well, we should monitor, oxygenation, ventilation, or both? And in order to answer this question, we may need to refresh our memory on few uh, key, uh, key aspects of the respiratory anatomy and physiology. But I think before we do that, let's review again. Uh, and the key, the key to the uh, to the question will be just rel just um, uh, observing this slide. Uh, we have two different processes; they are extremely uh, correlated, but they are again separate mechanisms. One is again the process of uptake of oxygen, while the other one is in charge of again ventilation. So let's review what some of the medical societies recommend in regards to monitoring. But that's exactly important in, in regards to trying to establish what they think. Back in the 1980s, uh, ICORN was the, uh, probably the one who received credit for suggesting that monitoring should be performed during anesthesia. Uh, this idea, of course, was rapidly adopted at Harvard Medical School and different societies. Uh, since then, um, again, societies such as the American Dental, even the American Dental Association have adopted uh, routine monitoring for procedures that require the use of sedatives or opioids. What uh, may appear ironic, uh, just by looking at the table, is the fact that the American Society of Anesthesia only recommends intermittent monitoring of ventilation when moderate sedation is used, while other organizations, such as, again, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation, the Joint Commission, have been very clear on recommending continuous capnography for any level of sedation and general anesthesia. Well, uh, I guess one of the challenges we encounter when trying to promote uh, rigorous, rigorous uh, monitoring is the fact that sometimes recording vital signs, in particular respiratory rate, is far from being optimal. If we miss a document respiratory rate, it becomes obvious that delays in recognizing respiratory depression will occur more often than what we expect. Uh, these delays may be as long as sometimes, again, 12 hours. And I don't think I have to say this, but it may be catastrophic for some patients at risk for respiratory depression, which can, uh, in this case, can, can go undetected. Uh, early recognition, of course, will make interventions more successful, will reduce uh, rescue calls and reduce ICU admissions in particular during the first 24 hours, which has been found to be the period of time with uh, the higher risk for post-op respiratory compromise. So let's go ahead and just revisit a little bit the uh, respiratory anatomy and physiology. Uh, 
I still remember to this day studying in the School of Medicine, these uh, physiologists, uh, Geitun, Geitun, uh the textbook of medical physiology is probably as old as I am, uh, 27. And it clearly states that there are four particular events that compromise respiration, ventilation, gas exchange, gas transport, and the control of ventilation. However, what he defines as ventilation is a, is a little bit different. It, uh, he defines ventilation as the movement of gas between the environment and alveoli, where oxygenation is more a function of arterial content of oxygen, but also depends on adequate ventilation and perfusion. So in the setting of sedation and anesthesia, hypoventilation is the most likely cause of hypoxemia. And sometimes, again, we probably remember this from the physiology that we took some time ago. So let's look at the uh, uh, monitoring of oxygenation and what is the impact of this. So how do we, how, how do we follow, again, this oxygenation? Uh, let's review, again, so yes, we, I think we are forced sometimes to review the uh, physiology. We know that, uh, again, if you remember, most oxygen bodies is bound to hemoglobin, uh, leaving roughly only 1% to 2% uh, dissolved in plasma, which is, by the way, the, the one we measure in blood gases. Uh, if we, we try to determine arterial oxygen saturation by measuring with the pulse oximeters, we don't have to examine the patients uh, to determine oxygenation. So, again, how we monitor the, the patients uh, this varies a lot. Uh, we, can, we can observe, we can try to determine exactly what happens with the skin or oral, oral mucosa by trying to determine if you have, for example, the presence of cyanosis. But this, uh, unfortunately, this may not signal hypoxemia until the PaO2 is critically low. Uh, cyanosis in many cases is, only happens in patients until saturations drop below 80%, probably in a PaO2 of less than 50. And um, you probably know that all the uh, PA, of course, the PaO2 and the oxygen indices that are typically derived from PaO2 that needs to be obtained invasive, invasively. So if you are trying to get OI, oxygenation index, the PF ratio, and the PAO2, again, they all require blood samples. You may get away with that, but of course, by looking at pulse oximetry and, of course, the uh, a different ratio, the SpO2, FiO2. I think we all were uh, trained somehow to just learn something about the pulse oximetry and how it works. Uh, you know the pulse oximeter comprises a light emitting diode that simply measures the absorption of these uh, specific wavelengths of light that differ between oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. So light at the wavelength of 616 nanometers, which is red, uh, is selectively absorbed by oxygenated hemoglobin, and light at a wavelength of 940 nanometers, which is the infrared, is absorbed by the deoxygenated hemoglobin. So the ratio of this light absorption is calculated by the pulse oximeter, uh, pulse, pulse oximeter according to an internal computer algorithm uh, to provide a reading uh, of a patient's arterial hemoglobin oxygen saturation. And I don't think I have to argue with anyone that the, the progress that we have made or people have made to, uh, for us in regards to pulse oximetry has been extremely significant in the medical care of patients. So some of the things that we have to consider is, of course, that the, um, the position is no longer just a finger or a toe. We have now sensors that are available for the nose, ear, and cheek, and the new technology, of course, that can be applied to the neck. And but we have to consider that, of course, uh, the pulse oximetry will be dependent on pulse type flow, that the ambient light can interfere with the wavelengths that are being detected. We have gotten much better about motion artifact, but there's no question that, of course, is important in the accuracy of our uh, readings. And when you have, of course, nail polish, uh, both for male and female, dark or metallic, and acrylic fingernails will interfere and uh, will give uh, false uh, low readings. So I think it is, it is at one point that the 90% that we have heard from the oxygen dissociation curve will be very important because after this point, the accuracy of the reading in general uh, just um, decreases. And of course, 90% would be very important because typically at a PA2 of 60, that's when you will have uh, critical complications because you are on the steep uh, part of the O2 dissociation curve. But as everything else, pulse oximetry has its own limitations. Uh, many consider, the, despite the technology, that information that a pulse oximeter displays is, is actually all news. That something may be just happening on the patient just way before saturations drop, and I'll explain that in just quite a minute. 
uh, unfortunately, we, when we combine this with ventilation, we realize that sometimes adequate ventilation is restored, and still we see changes on oxygen saturation that happened just way before, just way after that. So they lag behind. Uh, by the same token, when a patient is on oxygen and you see changes on ventilation, it will take some time to, again, see or appreciate changes on oxygenation. That's why, again, it may be all news regardless of the technology. And again, the delay confirms that pulse oximetry doesn't measure ventilation per se, regardless of the technology that you have available to you. Uh, I just wanted to share with you some of the information in regards to what do we obtain with continuous pulse oximetry. And I think it, it is, uh, has little argument that if you have continuous pulse oximetry, it has been shown to reduce the ICU stay and estimated cost in the ICU care. You're able to detect those uh, uh, post-operative uh, hypoxic events much more often. And of course, sometimes, again, if you have the adequate uh, alarms, you can reduce significantly the number of rescue events and ICU transfers. So all, all of this at the expense of technology. The latest uh, Cochrane meta-analysis, again by Patterson, uh, recently in March of 2014, looked at, uh, again, uh, specifically this topic, pulse oximetry for, uh, for perioperative monitoring. And uh, they noticed that they tried to detect if the pulse oximetry was associated with improvement in detecting and treating hypoxemia, reduction of morbidity and mortality, as you see, and, of course, unplanned respiratory admissions to the ICU, typically as a result, again, of a respiratory compromise. The, uh, what they listed as implications for practice, you see here, is that there's a, there's a vast proliferation of monitoring and anesthesia. And the more monitoring we have, the more alarms we have. But there's no question that the goal of monitoring should be, again, to, uh, to support this clinical decision in reducing the incidence of complication. And it would be very useful, I would mention at the end, to have very accurate information, not inaccurate or false alarms, because then you will add also the human factor. What if you have the perfect device, but then you don't have the training and the ability to, again, distribute this piece of equipment according to uh, guidelines. So every single uh, individual as personnel is trained to do this. So can you eliminate the uh, human factor by creating technology that allows you to, again, just simply bypass your brain, your thinking. So symmetry also, when you look at the, uh, the other implications for practice, is the, the SpO2 substantially reduced the extent of perioperative hypoxemia when you have pulse oximetry, but again, on continuous fashion. And of course, enables the treatment of hypoxemia before, again, the patient uh, is uh, much more profound in the side effects of general anesthesia or deep sedation. So it's, it's quite clear to us that sometimes, again, you can see the reduction or improvement of these outcomes, but by the same token, it would be hard to tell exactly the post-op complications have been just simply reduced by the implementation of continuous pulse oximetry. So what about the, again, the uh, physiology of ventilation? So uh, we see that although ventilation may be normal, oxygenation can be inadequate because it typically depends on the low inspired PO2 or the uh, perfection of the tissues. Ventilation, again, according to uh, Guyton, um, involves the deliveries of delivery of O2 to the alveoli, but also the delivery of CO2 to the external environment. Uh, so that means that the respiratory centers are going to just simply respond to changes, again, in pH, typically the hydrogen ion concentration, and, of course, a decline in the PaO2. But when you look at, really, at the carbon dioxide, the carbon dioxide really becomes a true measure of ventilation. And again, I'm, I'm not going to bore you with details, but you probably know again how it is transported into the system. And the one uh, that we typically measure, 7% uh, dissolved in, PA in blood, is the one that is consistent with the arterial uh, partial concentration of CO2. But again, the patient may be well oxygenated. While you and I may have a tidal volume of 450 or so, our FRC is, is quite bigger. It may be, again, five times larger. So that means that that becomes our O2 reserve. So in the presence of apnea, the O2 is not going to stop. It's going to continue diffusion into the pulmonary capillaries. And of course, as that's the principle behind the pre-oxygenation, that you want to, again, provide as much as you can with a higher FR, a higher FIO2 to, the, to that FRC, just in case, again, the patient requires oxygenation. But unfortunately, what happens is that the time from apnea to hypoxemia will vary a lot, but it will be always a delayed process that depends also on age, size, and the medical condition. So what about, again, monitor ventilation? So if we look at, again, monitor, monitor ventilation, we can go back to 
typically uh, of serving skin and the mucus um, mucus collar. But of course, this doesn't signal hypercapnia. Sinus doesn't signal hypercapnia. So PaCO2 needs to be typically obtained, basically, unless, of course, you rely on respiratory rate, transcutaneous, and, of course, caprography, which are, again, very widely accepted methods to determine ventilation. If we look at the physical exam, one of the limitations that we're going to have is that it, it could be challenging. It takes a lot of time. Again, even if you want to just simplify the rule of 15 times 4, it will take some time to, to count. And then you don't know exactly the same respiratory rate is going to be obtained a minute later. You have to observe chest movement, but what if, again, it is not that clear? Maybe you have to auscultate. Maybe the patient has nasal flaring. What about if you have thoracophthalmic asynchrony? What if you have the presence of retractions? So all of these things may impose on challenges to make a respiratory rate from patient assessment extremely reliable. But then I guess you can you can incur into technologies such as, for example, the uh, impedance plethysmography that actually senses the, the chest wall motion, but they may fail to detect airway obstruction and distinguish from abnormal abnormal wall movement because all it is measuring again is just wall movement. Has this become better? with less noise, less, uh, again, less signal uh, errors? Absolutely. But I would say that you probably have to agree with me that the purest measure of adequacy of ventilation at this point is really, truly the uh, CO2 tension. So how do we monitor this? So if we look at, again, uh, a different terminology, uh, looking at the CO2 monitoring capnometry will be just simply the number. Well, the capnogram will be the display of the waveform analysis of the breath, and capnography just simply puts all of those two together. When we look again at the waveforms, these uh, waveforms may tell us a lot of information about what's going on, from having slow respirations when you have, again, the effects of the opioids. What if you have the patient undergoing a procedure, even a procedural sedation, but has OSA, and you may see airway obstruction? What if the patient has free breathing because they have a baseline uh, COPD? Or what if the patient just simply becomes disconnected or, again, loses the airway or the patient is completely just apneic? So this information can be just readily obtained by just looking at the entitled CO2 monitoring. What about, again, continuous entitled CO2? Uh, well, before, the, before we do that, I think it's just quite a simple experiment that we do. So what, when we try to answer the question, it should it be oxygenation? Could it be ventilation? Could it be both? Uh, one experiment that I do with my students often just to let them realize exactly what happens with capnography and pulse oximetry is that what do you hold your breath? What happens to the waveforms? How long does it take again before the entitled CO2 waveform go flat? Goes flat and then the flat lines in just uh, less than a second. However, how long is it, does it take for the pulse oximetry to drop below 90%? Well, you'd be surprised. Just run the experiment. It will take 30 seconds, one minute, maybe a minute and a half, maybe even up to two minutes. So I can, again, so it's quite clear that, again, we, we cannot just simply just confound the effect of measuring pulse oximetry and CO2 separately might be together unless, again, there's a, uh, unless you have an additional technology that allows you to monitor both at the same time. In regards to the clinical impact, you can see that entitled CO2 may provide an earliest indicator of respiratory care uh, because hypercapnia, as I mentioned before, can occur with uh, normal SpO2s. And uh, again, regardless of what we have in regards to the American Society of Anesthesiologists uh, recommending just for the intermittent use and only continuous for deeply sedated patients, uh, it is clear by Dr. Overbeck, who uh, in fact is going to provide you with more, much more information in the upcoming webinar on new technology to monitor patients. Uh, he was able to detect that Pulse oximetry in this 178 patients receiving PCA was much more common than what you see here, the 1 to 7 percent, and the respiratory rate less than 10 for even three minutes was 41 percent, and then even to up to two minutes, 58 percent. So this is, again, very, very high just to, uh, again, not being able to detect uh, some patients undergoing uh, any type of procedure observation. So what happens when you, let's say, incorporate or implement capnography for PCA? Uh, according to this study by Collins, they noticed a 40% reduction in the reversal of PCA narcotics, including naloxone, and again, 100% reduction in this probably sometimes unnecessary transfers if you, if you actually implement uh, the capnography. 
In this uh, particular study by, by Weber, after a patient death from over sedation, they clearly implemented uh, monitoring and they, they noticed a, re a reduction again, as, uh, as previously mentioned, the naloxone and more, more than 600 days without any serious safety respiratory event, which has been again alarming in regards to what we have from the uh, uh, Anesthesia Safety Patient uh, Foundation and of course the Joint Commission. In this uh, particular study by Quarter, uh, Quarter uh, in 247 patients undergoing a GI procedure, uh, they compared the study arm, a team that was blinded to capnography, while the open arm was able to prompt capnography changes, and the primary endpoint was the occurrence of hypoxemia. As you can clearly see on this uh, the following table, um, the, the two most important parameters, the most significant changes were observed on being able to detect the hypoxemic events. So when we were blinded, there were about 132 that were actually cut by half when you introduce capnography. You can see not exactly half, but the episodes of apnea much more lower. But in general, every single parameter that they compare was significantly different when they implemented the capnography. In this uh, study, also for uh, pediatric patients, 163 children undergoing GI procedures, uh, they also, again, not a significant, a significant difference. The primary outcome was pulse oximetry, less than 95% for five seconds. So just simply informing the team exactly what was going to happen in regards to the procedure. And the results were actually quite uh, a substantial difference. Uh, so the endoscopy staff documented poor ventilation in about 3%. So please pay attention to this 3% and exactly how this 3% com becomes a 56% of a little hyperventilation. Apnea, yeah, about 24%. So that means that the number of events is uh, multiplied by just, again, a significant number just by the addition of uh, uh, capnography. In this particular case, when you try to incorporate the RTs and, and the pain management using the entitled CO2 monitoring, uh, this study by Fox uh, clearly shows that uh, compared to 2007, now to June uh, of 2011, there was a dramatic reduction on, on the adverse uh, drug, uh, drug effect, effects uh, that were associated with, again, uh, the um, uh, respiratory depression. As mentioned by Jonathan Waugh in, in respiratory care just a while back, is that they, they reflect a completely different mechanism, but cases of respiratory depression were 28 times uh, less likely to be detected if they were monitored by capnography as those who were not, not monitoring. And titled carbon dioxide monitoring is an important addition to oximetry for detecting respiratory depression. So, what about, again, trying to just uh, get away from, uh, from these traditional ones and just try to concentrate on respiratory rate? So if we look at respiratory rate, what we would see, of course, is that it's assessed typically in a clinical manner. Counting chest wall movements, again, as I mentioned before, time-consuming, uh, intermittent nature. So you get, a, again, respiratory rate now, but it's going to be twice as, uh, twice as much in a couple of minutes. And, of course, it's going to be prone to observer error. So... It is, of course, one of the earliest indicators, and I think it's, it's been very clear that uh, not only, again, the presence of infection, respiratory depression, and respiratory failure, but are, the complications are much more common um, when they are associated with, uh, again, changes in respiratory rate. There is a good chance that if, if your patient has, again, tachypnea or bradypnea, they're going to be, again, uh, at a higher risk for ICU admission, as you can see, uh, from this, uh, the last bullet, the strongest predictor of ICU admission. What else, again, you can do, uh, you can continue with the physical exam, plus, uh, again, manual count. You can have ECG-based uh, transthoracic impedance system, uh, nasal thermistors, abdominal and chest pads, uh, like, again, respiratory inductance, uh, plethysmography. That will estimate, again, respiratory rate, but, um, again, unfortunately, what happens is that sometimes the noise could be very high and in some instances can influence the total respiratory rate that you can get on patients. But also you can use a photoplethysmographic uh, respiratory rate, which is a computer, uh, computer oximeter respiratory rate that analyzes continuously a wavelet transform, uh, transformation technology. So it, use, it uses that technology to determine exactly the accuracy of respiratory rate. There has been, I'm going to just show you a couple of studies, 
that uh, have been conducted. I mean, there's more than a couple of uh, studies, but uh, what you can just want to pay attention is again that the, the correlation, the agreement between the oximetry derived respiratory rate and the, 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 the one derived by entitled CO2 was actually a very close agreement, uh, minus uh, 0 0.48. So again, very close in, the, in regards to the detection of the respiratory rate by both mechanisms. In this particular uh, study uh, that's uh, just coming up by Goucher, uh, they just compare, okay, what if we have capital mask, and then we just compare this to visual inspection and the thoracic impedance. So, and the results were, were actually very clear comparing uh, that they show a level of agreement with the capital mask that is measuring CO2 uh, much better than what they found with the impedance pneumography. So, and it was not influenced by the supplemental oxygen flow rate, which is again very critical in determining again the effects of oxygen uh, for these patients. Uh, but again, there are new newer technologies. I appreciate again Diane Ladd from uh, uh, from Experon just uh, just sharing this last for me on the use of respiratory volume monitoring. Uh, that places just simply electrodes uh, along the sternum, and then just simply by doing this, monitors continuous measurements of tidal volume. Mid ventilation and respiratory rate is a real-time respiratory volume curve that can be providing uh, trends of the measured variables. Uh, a couple of uh, studies uh, that were able to find on this technology uh, clearly show that there is uh, probably an average, average error less than 10%. Uh, this is again on 31 ambulatory patients, but again showing that there was not a significant difference between the spirometry and again the respiratory, respiratory rate and minute volume derived from these individual measurements, measurements uh, which is again, again very encouraging for uh, newer technologies. This is also, again, trying to measure apneic events uh, because it is, again, is an algorithm that has been built not to calculate just uh, every single breath, uh, but, again, just to get the overall picture, which is sometimes what we miss by measuring intermittently what happens to patients. Some of the limitations that have been listed, of course, include uh, that it may be costly, uh, more than probably just the pulse oximeter that you have. Uh, it requires specialized hardware. It um, may require technical challenges because you have to train personnel. Uh, intrusive because sometimes, again, patients don't want things attached to, to their skin, and of course it will be time consuming. So what about, again, on this last part, what about monitoring uh, uh, respiratory function by just simply combining parameters? Uh, I think it's clear that when you combine uh, pulse oximetry and entitled CO2, uh, you may have, again, a reduction, a significant reduction in the overall adverse event. Uh, one of the obstacles to implementation, of course, will be that now you have a piece of equipment with probably about four different alarms versus two, and that may promote more alarm fatigue. Uh, but again, I think we have these days very, um, uh, very advanced technologies in terms of the algorithms that will typically select, again, the signal to avoid uh, exactly this. One other way to combine uh, parameters will be the integrated pulmonary index, uh, just simply by combining the four parameters, entitled CO2, respiratory rate, pulse oximetry, and of course heart rate into one, and just provide again a, a measurement of how the patient is doing from a, in, on a scale of one to ten by just providing an algorithm that combines this, uh, these different numbers and again um, uh, gives information to the clinician on how well the patient may, doing, may be doing and um, if the patient really requires any particular intervention at the point. What about Putting all of this together and trying to do some virtual remote monitoring, I think it is clear uh, more and more that the better access you have in a virtual manner to all this information, and not only about monitoring, but all, all about the information from the patient, may allow you not to do only research, but also benchmarking and trying to establish risk factors that you may encounter uh, uh, again by providing this virtual remote monitoring. Um, instead of just having just isolated measurements on the patient. So I think we have to come to identifying the right monitoring device. And I think it is clear that both patients and clinicians may have a completely different idea. But I think overall I try to sum this up by saying that I think it has to be continuous in nature. We cannot just believe that intermittent measuring monitoring or respiratory function is going to provide us with the overall picture of what's going on with the patient. 
absolutely non invasive. I think it's very clear that micro sampling, even with the uh, uh, point of care testing, has replaced the, the fact that we had to get three mLs every single time we we had to get a blood gas. But I think the the way the way it should go is by creating more uh, non invasive measurements. Again, pulse oximetry, even coximetry that is non invasive. Trying to get uh, O2 content. Trying to get microvascular um, ideas of what's going on on the region regional oxygenation is again is non invasive. It has to be simple to operate because sometimes technologies are again very uh, very accurate, but they are not that simple for the user. It has to be an obstruction uh, an an to the patient, so the patient can have uh, comfort by using this technology. It makes a difference by, again, trying to monitor respiratory rate from a pulse oximeter uh, that is derived from pulse oximetry versus actually just wearing a cannula with the oral flap. That can make a difference, uh, even though you have both technologies. It has to be accurate. Um, to minimize, again, signal errors, um, you don't want, again, a particular device that is not being built with the algorithm that detects that the patient may be just simply coughing or talking, and then you determine that the CO2 can change because of this. It has to be fast because we don't want all this. We want to be able to correct the changes as soon as they happen. It has to be robust in the presence of signal interference, as I mentioned before, and, of course, it would be ideal uh, just because of the EMR and all the systems to be compatible with the central monitoring systems that you have in place. So I'm going to finish by just making just a simple uh, recommendation, and this is actually just coming from the Joint Commission back in August 2012. That really can just sums this up is that I think you have to really match the technology with good education. I think that happens to all of us who at one point have practiced respiratory, respiratory care and continue to practice respiratory care is that it is not the type of nebulizing, how modern, how cool it is, how, how good is the mass medium airway diameter, but ultimately a combination of, again, having a good clinician who's educated about this, having a good device, and also, again, being able to instruct the patient on how to use this. I think it is clear, and I'm hoping that I'm able to, I was able to convince you that we cannot just simply separate pulse oximetry from capnography. They are just measuring two different things, and I think the best combination would be to be able to combine both ventilation and oxygenation into just a single device. So in conclusion, I think um, I'm hoping that also you get clear that respiratory compromise from, again, atelectasis pneumonia to arrest is much more common than we believe. It can cost a lot of money, again, up to probably about $53,000 per, per case, and it could be deadly. Again, the mortality associated with this may be just going high, and it may be undetected. That I think the continuous monitoring really offers the advantage of our conventional intermittent monitor because, again, it's a real time detects early phases of respiratory depression. It may allow us to, again, save for titration of sedatives and analgesics, even though we may know a lot about this. And, of course, we, we can, just for patient safety, it's very clear that we can lower all of these adverse events that uh, I, mean, I was able to report to you. Uh, monitoring respiratory rate, tidal warning, minute ventilation. I think our sound and emerging alternatives to make ventilation monitoring more robust. They are non-invasive. They take some training, but it's everything else. Uh, just the fact that it takes a little bit more of training should not prevent us from using technology that allows us uh, to detect uh, uh, issues on these patients. I think ultimately, again, uh, I know it is an expensive proposition. I don't make those decisions in my institution, in my school, but I think integration, as expensive as it sounds, will be, again, the present in the future uh, for monitoring parameters on both ventilation and oxygenation. Uh, this remote uh, virtual access, again, facilitates monitoring from, again, all standpoints because every single clinician should be allowed to just having this piece of information. So with this, I, I conclude my presentation. I'll be more than happy to entertain a few questions um, after just uh, Emily, Emily's important announcement. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. That was really informative. And now, Doctor, the first question comes from Russell. As stated, Joint Commission and ASA have recommendations regarding the use of ETCO2. A great deal of procedures are done outside the hospital and hospital ORs. What do you think is the greatest hurdle in making this the standard of care in all areas? That's a great question. Uh, I think the answer is, is quite simple. Uh, introducing a piece of equipment 
to any suite, uh, it doesn't matter again if it is the ward, the ICU, uh, has to has to go through different processes. And I guess I, I can only imagine again the administrator thinking, well, great, uh, welcome, I welcome saving lives, but how much is it going to cost me? Uh, and the cost will be associated not only to the piece of equipment, but also again to the education of the staff, uh, the process of implementation. And finally, being able to rely on, again, as, as good a relationship as I have with industry, I have to always point out to them is that you just don't simply dump the piece of equipment that you have to follow up with the education. Either you provide it yourself, you hire somebody else, but there should be a continuous of competency because in many instances what has happened with many ventilators out there and with monitoring devices is, that, is the fact that, again, the staff is just left alone with a piece of equipment that is supposed to be just um, a cure or just uh, provide miracles to the patients. But I think it's clear that I mean, cost is a major obstacle, but after that, education. Let me give you an example also of something else is that it would be a shame, let's say, getting capnographs and instituted everywhere without a good documentation, which is a different presentation about waveform analysis. How do you know exactly what you see in the number is a reflection of what's going on on the waveform? So it is a very good question because it encompasses typically what happens. The other one that is very important is because I've heard this again uh, by providing this information uh, just uh, uh, nationwide is what about those patients who have a lot of vacuum mismatch? What about those patients who have hemodynamic compromise? Uh, that's why we don't have that. We don't trust it. I think this, again, lack of knowledge in regards to how do you use a piece of equipment for trending and making sure that now when the entitled CO2 was low or the gradient was very high, it's because you have this VQ mismatch. But then again, how the CO2 goes up as an indication of better perfusion and very matching. So I think there's a lot of information that can be explaining uh, why um, you don't have the degree of use of continuous, uh, let's say, capnography in this case, as it should be. Here's a question from Catherine. Have you used the metaneb with non-invasive hypoventilated patients, and what was the outcome? Uh, I haven't. I haven't used the metaneb. Uh, the, uh, the use of metaneb here is more in the surgical ICU. And that's for the typical indication of atelectasis and sometimes mnemonic process, mucociliary clearance. Uh, but in, I haven't used this for that particular group of patients, and I have experience with them also in the bench model with pig lungs, and, uh, but not in that particular group. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Fair enough. Melissa is asking, does the ASA recommend capnography or only waveform? Uh, the statement reads about capnography, but again, uh, keep in mind that capnography, even by the American uh, Heart Association, includes the waveform. Uh, the emphasis on the, uh, let's say, the restoration of uh, spontaneous circulation refers to a number two, which is the capnometer. But again, the presence of the waveform would be very important to determine if you have airway obstruction. So just looking at the number itself, just the capnometer itself, uh, doesn't solve the situation. So I wouldn't concentrate only on the waveform. Even though I can, I have to say this: when you know how to interpret the waveform, you have the capnometer with you because uh, all you have to do is just measure the scale on the waveform to determine exactly where the entitled CO2 is. So, if I were to choose one, of course, the waveform will give me everything. Uh, same thing with the plethysmographic waveform of the pulse oximeter; it gives me the accuracy of the of the uh, of the waveform if the signal is strong enough, so I can get both pieces of information, the quality of the waveform and the number, without looking directly at the number. Thank you, doctor. Here's a couple of questions from Melissa. Who makes a cheek sensor cheek probe? I don't know the, uh, I don't know the, the name of the company. Um, yeah. Um, again, you probably saw, saw my disclosure anyway, but I really try to, uh, sometimes stay away from what the manufacturer in terms of the technology. I know, but I haven't used that. And honestly, when we use actually the forehead probe, uh, you probably know from which company uh, we used it. And we had some issues, and we just, again, defaulted back to actually by the same company to the finger probe. So I, I, I don't know. I don't really know exactly uh, uh, who manufactures that. I'm sorry about that. Oh, that's all right. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate that. Jean is asking, what would you recommend for the length of time of ETCO2 monitoring for post-op patients with PCA? 
Hmm. That's a very good question. Let me answer by saying this. Um, when I reviewed a legal case, a patient was off pulse oximetry, the patient was off PCA, and still the patient died of respiratory depression 24 hours later. Um, again, for somebody in the early 40s without any significant morbidity, for this situation to occur, I would say that you have to make sure that the PCA just by itself is not a solution. So once you stop the PCA, you have to think, okay, what else is the patient on? Because the patient is, con is continuing on, on PO opioids, if the patient is still on morphine or Phenergan or any type of opioid, and the patient is especially at risk. Remember what I mentioned before, so patients who are obese who have OSA, who have a baseline disease, I will encourage you to just, just to make sure that the patient is monitored until you are absolutely sure that the patient is probably on a very low uh, sedative or opioid before you just let pulse oximetry tell you that in this particular case, the uh, patient is not on oxygen, saturation are 92, and simply the patient is going to be fine. Uh, I can tell you that this particular patient had saturations in the 90s. Uh, of course, some of those were unmonitored, and when you look back at the trends, uh, there were some of them in the low 80s, and the patient was breathing six times per minute. So I, I can tell you that I'm, I'm actually very scared of just going to a procedure myself, uh, thinking that what if I don't have any risk? Would you monitor me continuously? And the answer would be, oh, yes. Just make sure that you check on my insurance that CO2 and O2 are continuously monitored. So if I if I recommend if I have to make a recommendation, just do it as long as you can because again it's not going to really add a lot of cost uh, to the patient's monitoring, but it's going to save a lot of lives. Thank you, doctor. That's an important one. I'm glad that you emphasized that. Uh, Melissa has a question. What problems have you encountered with the forehead probe? Uh, the forehead was most um, in the ICU. That was kind of my experience in the pediatric ICU. Uh, sweat. Um, again, um, when we had a patient with a TBI and sometimes we had the ICP bolts, uh, we, we had issues with axes. Um, so sometimes, again, they were not sticking as, uh, as good as we, we wanted to. Uh, but again, that was our, our own personal experience. And to be honest with you, I think we, we adopted just, uh, again, just a finger probe, but it didn't mean that the entire institution actually just switched. I mean, they, they didn't have any issues in the cardiac ICU, for example, so it, it really depends. It would just matter just uh, kind of just preference and our own experience with this, and you may have encountered the same thing with a wrap-up or just a simple simple probe, or if you use, again, the forehead versus uh, nowadays, if you use uh, one on the neck, you may have, well, excellent quality, but then you have issues because axis. So I think it's, it was more like a personal preference and just, again, not issues that should prevent anyone uh, from using a forehead probe. Thank you, doctor. Here's a question from Janice. Is it common practice around the country to chart incentive spirometry every four hours for patients on step-down floors on pain meds? Wow, that's, that's a really good question. Well, um, not with it with a different intention than just to share something. I mean, as chair of the clinical practice guidelines, uh, we published the uh, insurance parameter guideline, and of course I received plenty of emails saying, how, how, would, you, how would you do that uh, in regards to killing insurance parameter? I think my intention wasn't that. I think we reviewed the evidence, and it's not a consensus or a personal preference. In terms of spirometry, I think it's, it's clear that when you use this as a mon as monotherapy, if you just simply rely on insulin spirometry to uh, just radically or dramatically reduce post-op complications, uh, you are using the wrong thing. I think insulin spirometry should be used along with deep breathing exercises, early mobilization, and anything else that you have. Maybe some of those patients may require, in addition to that, uh, high high frequency chest wall oscillation. So. Uh, yes, it is routinely prescribed. I think it's probably the one thing on hyperinflation therapy that is routinely uh, prescribed more than anything else, uh, even sometimes more than deep pregnant exercise, which, again, to me is kind of just a shame, or early mobilization. We mobilize patients in the ICU, but then in the post-op, we, we want to keep them in bed just doing insurance spirometry every two hours. I think it's just the right combination should be using, again, as many things as you can to allow the patient to get out as soon as possible before they get sick. 
Thank you, Doctor. And here's a question again from Russell. What is the importance of a volumetric ETCO2 in this application? Uh, that's a very good question. Let me, let me keep it simple. Volumetric CO2 will give you much more information than the simple entitled CO2. Uh, it takes into account, into, into account again the different angles, the area under the curve, um, under the curve of the CO2. It is. Uh, it has been widely used in regards to winning because, again, the volumetric CO2 is going to be a much more accurate tool in regards to the CO2 production. It, take, it takes into account changes that you may encounter with metabolism and so on. Uh, I would say that it's a little bit more sophisticated tool. Um, we use it not extensively in the unit, um, but uh, but I think again it provides additional information. Uh, but let me let me let me say and let me make a recommendation. If you are a heavy uh, user of entitled CO2 and you haven't used volumetric, I think that would be the right step to go. But if you are not using carnography, getting into volumetric, unless you have, again, a good opportunity to get educated about all of this, you might as well to get, take full advantage of carnography as it is, as simple as it is with just the waveform, just a simple waveform and the capnometer versus actually venturing in a concept that may be a little bit more complicated. Because I have found that even just a simple waveform interpretation is, is really poor inclinations uh, out there. So I would say before you get into volumetric capnography, which again provides a vast, um, inf vast information in terms of information, uh, I would say try to start simple with the capnography. Doctor, thank you. We are almost out of time. Uh, let me ask you very quickly, this would be the last question. Do you think that it's necessary to monitor ETCO2 if the post-op OSA patient is placed on CPAP in the PACU? That's from Ann. So. You think and so? That's a very good question, and my answer should be yes. Uh, do we do it? I mean, if I, if I go now to see our post-op patients in the unit, uh, do we routinely do that? Again, I'm not very proud of just saying, well, we do not. What are the recommendations? Sometimes, again, we see guidelines. Sometimes we follow as much as we can. Sometimes we follow guidelines as much as we can convince our peers that this is important. Uh, but I always say, I mean, it's, it, it should be one of those that absolutely is a major risk factor has been recognized as one of, one of the significant risk factors for respiratory depression. And again, I'm not just simply talking about the post-op respiratory complication. I'm talking about respiratory depression and even arrest. So my answer for patients with OSA should be yes. My answer for BMI is not quite clear. You see some, again, some schools of thought that even a 30 or beyond 30 should be implemented. Some of them will actually just wait with, with a BMI that is greater than 35 to determine that routinely we're going to monitor these patients because those are the ones that develop more of the hyperventilation than those that had a BMI of less than, again, 20, less than uh, 30, for example. So again, my answer should be yes. Doctor, thank you very much. And we are now out of time for answering any more questions. I want to thank you so much because the information that you shared with us is absolutely vitally important in the assessment and identification of respiratory compromise in ventilation and oxygenation patients. And finally, last but not least, I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the audience today, for your time and your very thoughtful attention. Thank you, everyone. Take care and bye for now. Doctor, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome.